Good morning. Merry Christmas. It's good to see you today. It's good to see you today. I'm glad that you've come for worship, and I'm glad that you're excited to see one another. That's a good thing. Just a few announcements before we begin our service. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're having our uh, candlelight communion service. Uh, it'll be a special time to uh, just sort of focus our attention on the Lord uh, before we get too involved in presence and all of that. Uh, tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, it will probably be about a half an hour, right around there. I, think, I hope that uh, you made time in your schedule for that. No Wednesday night service this week. Um, next week will be New Year's Eve, regular service in the morning, and <coughs> next Sunday night will be our special uh, game night at 6 o'clock, and that will be a uh, mission theme. You'll want to be a part of that. Uh, today, after service, there will be a uh, gift from the church for each of you, and there will also be a gift from Rachel and me for, from, for each of you, so make sure that you see the appropriate person. The, other, the ones from the church will be at both doors, but you'll need to come over here to see Rachel to get yours from us right there. Uh, don't forget, I've put out some Bible reading schedules. Uh, for you to uh, prepare for the new year. It's not a New Year's resolution. It's a way to help you to uh, have a plan as you read through God's Word. It's good to have a plan. Random only works occasionally. Plans work better, especially when it comes to God's Word. Let's uh, stand, and we are going to read responsibly. Your words will be... Yeah. Sometimes our lives are messy from our own sin, from the sin of others, from the circumstances of a broken world. God does run from our messy lives. We sometimes believe God's love isn't big enough for our mess. We remember God's love is for us. We look back. And remember that God didn't flee from the messiness of humanity, but entered into it. We trust that God is faithful to enter into the messiness of our lives, too. We remember that God became a vulnerable human out of great love for humanity, entering into a messy family line to bring about redemption, hope, and peace. Our brokenness is restored to holiness and peace through Christ working in our lives. We repent, we confess, we lament, and we open ourselves up to Christ because we know He is faithful to forgive us and we can have peace and wholeness through Him. We receive the assurance that we are forgiven. We receive the promise of peace and wholeness through Christ. As we light the fourth candle, we ask God to bring us true peace and wholeness, confessing our brokenness and messiness before God. God did not flee the mess of humanity, but entered into it as a, as a baby. And we might remember that God will not flee our brokenness either, but that God loves us and restores us in the midst of it. Midst of it. Let's remain standing as we celebrate and worship the Lord this morning.
Well, we want to kind of remember our pastor and his lovely wife. I just want to read a little something out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I really feel that's what these two have done for us. This is from all of you to them. So Merry Christmas and thank you for all your service. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that a lot, Rachel. I feel very privileged to be here. And if you haven't heard me say it lately, I'll say it right now. I couldn't do this without her. I'm not sure I'd even try. Uh, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward at this time. We'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Father, thank you for your church. Thank you for the many blessings that we feel here, Lord. Not just at special times, but every, every time that we encounter your people. We thank you for the gift of the church to us. Help us to be faithful to one another and faithful to you with the gifts you've given us. May we be generous back to your kingdom. And may the tithes and offerings that are gathered today be put to your use. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
sometimes struggle with whether the love of God is big enough for us. Now, I know you want to say you don't. 
But I think one thing that we've been doing in this December is realizing that it's okay to be honest about some of these things. Even here on Christmas Eve, we might look at the story of a God who came as a baby and think, well, yes, that's great, but really God didn't come for me. I'm, I'm just too broken, too messed up. I'm too much for God. And if as we've been learning, it's okay to, to pray and to speak our lament before God, it's okay to be honest in this way also. As we struggle to think that God could have come for us, we come to realize that without him, our chance at peace is really non-existent. The world offers some ideas about how to gain peace, but they don't really work. They're very passing. Here on this last Sunday of Advent, with a psalm that once again focuses on the the chesed, the, the steadfast love of God, the faithfulness of God, the loving kindness of God. It's translated different ways in different versions. This psalmist uses King David as an example of his steadfast love. This psalm of lament points to the promise made to David, but it also alludes to David's failures. This psalm is a reminder that even in the mess of David's life, God was still faithful to him. God was still his peace. And if you're anything like me, when you think of somebody like David and the relationship that he had with God and, and the way that God seems to look at him, you probably quickly go think to yourself, well, yeah, but see, I'm not like David. Oh, but I think we're a lot like David. And I think that that might bring comfort to us today. We know that God does remember his people and that God is faithful because as we gather to celebrate the final Sunday of Advent here today on Christmas Eve, we know that the Messiah was born of the line of David, the ultimate illustration of God's steadfast love for all people. This psalm mentions David. We need to remind ourselves of David's story in becoming king. See, Israel had wanted a king, mostly because they looked at everybody else and said, well, they've got a king, and they've got a king. They've got a king. We want a king too. And so God told Samuel, his prophet, this was going to be part of his plan. And God chose Saul for them. Saul, however, did not really reciprocate and choose God. So Saul was rejected and Samuel was sent to find a replacement. Well, God had the replacement in mind. Samuel was really just following God so that God might show Samuel who was to be next. It was a tall order. Samuel didn't want to go pick the next king. He didn't have confidence in that, but he was putting his confidence in God that God would show him who to pick. And Samuel was directed to Jesse. Jesse had a bunch of sons. And Samuel looked at them all, starting with the oldest. And son after son after son was rejected until there were none left. And Samuel said to Jesse, is this it? And Jesse, in a great father moment, said, well, yeah, I mean, there's the youngest, but he's out tending sheep. <laughs> His dad didn't even consider him worth the uh, prophet's attention. That's a warm, pleasant, that'd be a great Father's Day message. But anyway, <laughs> they get David, and David, Samuel's like, yeah, that's the one. So David is remembered later as Israel's greatest king. He is the standard by which all subsequent kings were measured. If you've been reading along in the, the reading plan I gave you last year, you are in 2 Chronicles right now. And, as, and having come through 1 Chronicles in the last month and 2 Chronicles, king by king comes along, new king is introduced, and it always says, but he did not walk in the ways of David his father, or he did walk in the ways of David his father. But David's always the standard. Yet when we think of David, we might also think of a woman named Bathsheba. Things were going really well for David until the day he saw her. He broke a majority of the Ten Commandments in a really short amount of time. He saw her, and he wanted what was not his. So he coveted her. He had her brought to him, and he committed adultery. Of course, those actions would have greatly dishonored his parents. He had her husband called home under false pretenses. 
so he lied to him. Eventually, he arranged for his death. He murdered him, and he took his wife for himself. He stole. Not to mention that before any of that happened, he committed idolatry in his heart by, com by caring about what he wanted more than what God wanted. He completely messed up. It was a colossal failure. He disqualified himself by any reasonable measure. Yet he also did one other thing. He repented of his sins. He confessed that he had done wrong and that he had sinned against God. That action, not any of the others, is what caused David to be known as a man after God's own heart. Even in the New Testament, when we read in Matthew chapter 1 of the family line of Jesus, we see Jesus called the son of David. But in the lineage, you know, all those begats and all that business, in the lineage, Bathsheba is mentioned as the wife of Uriah. Be sure your sin will find you out indeed. Against this backdrop now, we're going to look at Psalm 89 verse one, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. Uh, we should note that this psalm is not written by David. It is going to be about David, but it is not written by David. It's actually written by Ethan. Ethan the Ezraite. Psalm 89 is another psalm of lament. You remember, I might have, you might remember, I told you a few weeks ago that 70% of all the psalms were laments. The people sing of the faithfulness, the steadfast love of God in the past, and of the promises of God toward the descendants of King David. But they also sing of despair. When we read at the beginning, this part here doesn't sound like despair at all. Now, if you're a little concerned that this is going to be another kind of a downer, a bunch of lament, most of the lament is later in the psalm, and we're not going to talk about that today. But the first couple of verses here are like a hymn of praise. Look how it starts. I will sing. This is a declaration. This is a declaration of a statement and a purpose, a, a statement of action. I will sing. I was recent, recently listening to the, the music from A Charlie Brown Christmas. And we watched it not long after that. You remember what the constant knock on Charlie Brown is by the other kids? He's so... Nobody knows? Good grief, you're cultural deficient. <laughs> he's so wishy-washy. Charlie Brown, he's so wishy-washy. That's what they mean when they say things like, of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you're the Charlie Brown. If you haven't seen Charlie Brown Christmas in a while, I'm, that's an assignment for you. Uh, but anyway, he was wishy-washy. You ever know anybody like that? You admire that in a person? A person who says, well, you know, I might praise God. Then again, I might not. That's nothing to be in, that, that, no one's inspired by that. But the psalmist, Ethan here, he tells us, no, I will sing the Lord's great love forever. I will. We ought to live in such a way that our actions are a witness to other people. We like the idea of a silent witness. It sort of requires less of us. But Ethan says he will use his mouth to make God's faithfulness known. We ought to be people with something to say for God. Ethan had no trouble believing that God's love would endure because he saw God's faithfulness established in creation. Ethan had accepted that God was create the creator and thus was able to take God at his word regarding his love. Let's look at the next passage, verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen uh, this is God speaking. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. That word selah means think about it. 
These next couple of verses put me in the mind of a couple of weeks ago when we talked about reminders. Ethan reminds God about the covenant that he made with David, about how that covenant was an eternal one. How could God have made such a preposterous claim? When, when the people went into exile, after all the kings, they went into exile in Babylon. When they went into exile, do you think they ever thought about God's promise of a son of David forever on the throne of Israel? I would think they thought about that all the time. They might have thought even kind of a lamenting sort of prayer. God, you said you would have a king here forever on the throne of David. Yet here we are in a foreign land and no king at all anywhere in sight. During the time of the Gospels, they were still desperately hoping for a son of David to come and take the throne. They were so ready for the Romans to be shown the door. They didn't like the Romans being there. But Jesus, he wasn't what they had in mind. So they did away with him. So they thought. Recently, I think I might have mentioned this already, but I'm going to say it again. I was in Springfield and I saw in a couple different places, big menorahs. It was during Hanukkah. And on the menorah, it said, Mashiach, now. Messiah, now. They're still waiting. They're still waiting for, holding out for the God that will be to their liking. But that's not just the Jewish people that do that. People reject Jesus every day because, well, he just isn't the kind of God that they're interested in. But Jesus did come. He did suffer and he did die on the cross. He did rise again and he will come back just as sure as he did the first time. And we are still waiting for that. Let's look at the, uh, jump down to verse 19. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. Also, my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. We could spend a great deal of time on these verses, but we're not going to. <laughs> Briefly, they're reminiscent of, of David. They're reminding themselves of God's choice for a king. But at the same time, they're forced to be reminded of all of David's descendants who were mostly, at best, pale reflections of him. They could read like I mentioned to you in First and Second Chronicles, it's also First and Second Kings. They can re read that rehashing of it and read how king after king didn't walk in the ways of David, his father. Or uh, the, of the good ones, many of them were, they walked in the ways of their father, though not all together. Not as well. It was almost like always, oh, almost, but not. It was almost as though the blood got thinner the more time went by. Then the exile came. Then what about God's promise? There's no king at all now. When the people went into exile, everything was gone. What happened to the covenant? See, in the Old Testament mindset, there were three things that were, that were real symbols of covenantal relationship. There was the city of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Davidic line. Other Psalms in this section have lamented the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem. But the falling of the line of kings that was the climax. That was the worst. This is partly addressed later on in this psalm. But these were symbols. They were signs of a greater truth. Jerusalem was a symbol of security to the Jews. But the people's true security should have been in God. The temple symbolized God's presence. But really, God was present with them in exile, too. The Davidic king symbolized God's control and governance over the nation. But they could have seen, had they eyes to see, that God controlled the armies of Nebuchadnezzar and God controlled King Cyrus, those that were not Jewish kings. 
We can't let our symbols or our beliefs about God become more important than God himself. The danger at Christmas time is that we long for baby Jesus. The baby Jesus. The, the Jesus that we can control. The Jesus we can pick him up when we want. Or we can just set him down whenever we're done with him. Confident that he's not getting out of there anytime soon. And I can go do what I want now. The line of kings was a mess. Did they ever think maybe it was because of David's sin that things had gone the way they had? That like it was a punishment because of all the things he'd done wrong? Do you ever think that? Things in your life aren't the way they, that you always imagined they'd be and then you start blaming yourself for all the problems? Is that what really happened here? Aren't, aren't we thinking? I mean, if you remember back, I started off talking about God's steadfast love. See, too many of us are good at really focusing on us more than we are on God. And the more we focus on us, the more discouraged we get. Because we ain't that great. Even at our best. We'd like to think we're better than we are. But when it's quiet and it's just us, we kind of know we're not that great. And as long as we focus on that, all we're going to see is problems. But we should focus on God's steadfast love. That's what we're supposed to be uh, focusing our attention on. God's promise to David was either true or it wasn't. I mean, we know that the Christmas story is the fulfillment of that promise. It wasn't a matter of God not keeping his promise at all. It was just an unexpected answer at an unexpected time. Many people were looking for a man of action, and God sent a prince of peace. We sometimes forget the messy reality of the Christmas story. Mary's choice to obey God had real consequences. Christ was born into vulnerability. None of that looks like we expected. When Mary, I said Mary's choices had consequences, Later on, when Jesus, you can read the Gospels and you can find examples of, you know, the Jesus having confrontations with the Jewish leaders. There's one point that they say, we have Abraham for our father. There's a lot going on in that statement, part of which is everybody knows who your dad was. Actually, they don't. They were calling him an illegitimate son. They weren't walking around saying, grudgingly accepting that God was his father. They didn't believe that. They thought he was an illegitimate son. Mary's choices had consequences. It was messy. You know, babies are always messy. I remember before my first son was born. My, my microphone is really bothering me. Sorry. Oh, that's why. Okay. Sorry. Pay no attention to that. There we go. Okay. That was so happy when I was taking my guitar off. I remember when my first son, right before he was born, I don't know what I expected. I'd seen babies before. But when, when I saw my oldest son, Isaac, when I saw him just seconds old, I was completely amazed. He looked different. He looked superior, frankly. He just he was better looking than all those other babies. I, I'd seen pictures. Later on, I don't know what happened. Later on, I saw pictures of, that we had taken of him when he was just that old. and Those pictures reminded me what he looked at like without the emotion of the moment attached. He was a mess. <laughs> he was pink and red, wrinkly. He was a mess. Jesus was a baby just like that. The incarnation was messy. God's redemptive purposes often involve messy solutions. We have to keep our eyes on God's plan. We also have to realize why God works the way he does. In verse 24, we read that through my name, his horn will be exalted. The blessing promised to David was actually to be a blessing to the people. God's blessings and his working 
his workings in our life, they are more than just for us to enjoy. When God blesses us, it's not because he likes you better than that other person. The blessing of God on your life is for others to also be benefited from. The covenant with Abraham, that wasn't just so Abraham's family could be better off. It was for all the nations. If we're constantly focused on getting a blessing, we might be disappointed. Perhaps instead of constantly praying that God would give us a blessing, maybe we should be asking that God would make us a blessing to other people. We often ask, where is God? Where's the love of God here and now? Some of us have situations in our life that we've asked that question, even if we were afraid to ask it out loud. Some of us have asked that recently. Where is God? Why'd this have to happen to me? I know what that's like. But when we look back, in order to look forward, we can see that God is here. Emmanuel, God with us. In the midst of our vulnerabilities, in the midst of all our messes, in the midst of the sin done to us, and also the sin that we have done. God longs to draw near to you. The Prince of Peace longs to come, even now, once again, to bring renewed hope into our lives. And we can sing with confidence, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Because God's love is steadfast for us, even now. God knows everything about you. Everything. The thing you most hope in the world that no one else will ever find out about you, God knows. And he still loves you. He smiles on you, and he most wants a deep relationship with you. He already knows that thing. You don't have to hide it from him anymore. He already knows, and he loves you anyway. He doesn't love you because you've been good at keeping that thing from him. Well, I know he likes me okay, but if he found out this, no, that's people. That's what we do to each other, but that's not the way God works. God's love is steadfast. We can have peace. We can have light. We can have love. We can know joy. We can enjoy peace because Jesus has come. And we can savor those things as we wait for him to come again. He is the Prince of Peace. He has come for us right here today, even for you. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your coming to us. We thank you for your steadfast love. Your love is beyond our understanding. It is certainly not due to our worthiness. You don't love us because we're exceptional examples humanity. We're not. We're just people. And we're people with messes. We're people that with messes that have been done to us and some that we've caused ourselves. But you came anyway. And you come at this moment speaking peace to each person here, Lord. There's not a single solitary soul here today that has done so many wrong things that you don't have an answer for them. There's not anyone that's done so many bad things that you just can't bear to look at them anymore. But everyone here is someone for whom you deeply long to have a close personal relationship with and long for them to have the peace that you can bring to them. Peace amidst a world of turmoil. Peace even when the wheels are all coming off. You can give that to us, Lord, and we ask you for it today. I ask you for your blessing on all these people, Lord. Not the blessing of a new gift. Not the blessing of an extra wrapped box under the tree, but the blessing of your personal presence in their life. May it be so this Christmas. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Don't forget, you can...